Hello everyone and welcome to QuickMed where medicine is explained quickly and easily. In this video, we will be going over abnormal uterine bleeding, which can sometimes be a difficult concept to understand, so let's get to it. All right, let's begin by going over the menstrual cycle, and we're going to go over this very, very briefly. If you'd like some more information, please let us know in the comments below and we can make a separate video, but this is just so that you can understand the content that is to follow. The menstrual cycle is a tightly coordinated cycle of stimulatory and inhibitory effects, and on average, it lasts about 28 days. So keep in mind, this is an average, so some women will have a longer cycle versus a shorter cycle. Day one of the menstrual cycle is the start of menses, or of a woman's period. Around day 14, which is mid-cycle, if you're taking a 28-day average cycle, this is when you get ovulation or the release of an egg from the ovary. And then about 14 days after ovulation, a woman's period begins, which leads to the beginning of another menstrual cycle, and then this cycle continues on and on about once a month. All right, so now that we've gone over the menstrual cycle, let's go over some standard definitions of what constitutes normal versus abnormal menstrual bleeding, and we'll start with frequency. A normal menstrual cycle should occur between 24 to 38 days. If it occurs below this range, we call this a frequent menstrual cycle, and if it's occurring more than this range, we call this an infrequent menstrual cycle. Let's now discuss amenorrhea, which is the absence of a menstrual cycle, and there are two forms of this. There is your primary and secondary amenorrhea. Primary amenorrhea is when there is no menstrual cycle by the age of 15. Secondary is when there is an absence of a menstrual cycle for six months in someone who previously had menstrual bleeding. Let's move on to our third definition, which is irregular bleeding. And what is the significance of irregular bleeding? Ideally, a menstrual cycle should be cyclical with ovulation occurring about 14 days prior to the onset of menses, as we mentioned earlier. And this is if you're looking at a 28-day average cycle. But as you can imagine, most menstrual cycles don't occur exactly every 28 days, for example. There's always going to be some sort of variation. But what's considered a normal variation? This really depends on age, as you can imagine, because with the onset of menarche, as well as around the premenopausal years, there can be a little bit more variation in the menstrual cycles than in a woman in her 20s to early 40s, for example. But really, this variation should not be more than 7 to 9 days for any age. So let's just summarize what we discussed so far. We talked about amenorrhea, which is an absence of a menstrual cycle, so that's an easy one to remember. We also talked about frequency of a menstrual cycle, which is how often is the menstrual cycle occurring. And we just discussed regularity of a menstrual cycle, which really goes over how predictable is that menstrual cycle. So let's conceptualize this idea of regular versus irregular bleeding through the form of a diagram. So here we're looking at a 60-day interval and we're assessing the cycle length. So the stars here indicate the onset of a menstrual cycle, and the cycle length is going to be the time it takes to get from one period to the next. So here we have menses that occurs on day one, and then again on day 28, so that is a 28-day cycle length. And then we see that the third period occurs on day 60, so if we take 60 minus 28, that gives us 32. So if we take this 32-day cycle and subtract it from the first 28-day cycle, that is a variation of four days, which is within normal limits here. Now let's take a look at this diagram here. We have a period that occurs on day 1, and then on day 15, and then on day 45. So the first cycle length is going to be 15 days, and then the second cycle length we'll calculate by subtracting 45 minus 15, so that is 30 days. So then we take these two numbers, 30 and 15, and subtract them, which gives us 15. So this is a 15-day variation in the cycle length, which is well above what we consider normal. So this is what we would refer to as irregular bleeding because the variation is well above what we would normally expect. And the final term we're going to go over here is heavy menstrual bleeding. And this can be very subjective and usually refers to the total amount or volume of bleeding that's occurring with each cycle. Most patients know what is normal for them in terms of what days they experience heavy bleeding versus lighter bleeding. And so if they express a concern that their bleeding has become heavier, this is something that should be evaluated further particularly if it's starting to have an effect on their quality of life. So what are some causes of heavy menstrual bleeding? So really think of structural causes here, like uterine fibroids, which are benign tumors that are found within the uterus, adenomyosis, which is when endometrial tissue begins growing within the muscular wall of the uterus, endometrial polyps as well, and then some non-structural causes to consider include coagulative disorders that predispose a patient to bleeding, as well as thyroid issues, which tend to be a cause of a lot of different types of abnormal uterine bleeding, so keep this in mind. So how would we evaluate this? So for your structural causes, we would get an ultrasound. Uh, for a coagulative disorder, you can obtain a CBC, which is also helpful because it can help rule out any iron deficiency anemia associated with the heavy bleeding, as well as look for a coagulative disorder. 
like a platelet dysfunction. You could also get coagulative factors if indicated, as well as a thyroid level, most commonly a TSH for a basic screen. Now let's go over some causes of amenorrhea, in particular secondary amenorrhea. The first and most commonly overlooked cause is actually pregnancy, so make sure to rule this out first. Other causes include a prolactinoma, thyroid issue, primary ovarian insufficiency, as well as hypothalamic dysfunction. So how would we evaluate for these causes? So first, for pregnancy, you can obtain a urine pregnancy test. For prolactinoma, we can get a prolactin level. For a thyroid issue, we get a TSH, as we mentioned before. And then to check for a primary ovarian insufficiency or hypothalamic cause, we can obtain an FSH and an estradiol level or an estrogen level. So we need to obtain both of these hormone levels in order to differentiate where the issue is. If it's in the ovary itself, you'd have a low estrogen level and a high FSH level. If it's within the hypothalamus, you'd expect a low FSH level as well as a low estrogen level. Let's now go over some causes of irregular bleeding, but first we need to understand why irregular bleeding occurs in the first place. Irregular bleeding is typically associated with ovulatory dysfunction, so this is where you're not having cyclical ovulation as you would expect in a normal menstrual cycle. So patients here will typically have oligoovulation in which they shift between ovulatory cycles and anovulation. So patients here will typically say that they've had phases of no bleeding that can last for about two months or more, and then phases with either spotting or episodes of heavy bleeding. So if you think about it here, with irregular bleeding, the causes are going to be similar to those of amenorrhea because in both cases you're experiencing anovulation at times, but with amenorrhea it's really prolonged, whereas with irregular bleeding it can alternate between anovulatory and ovulatory cycles. So as we've said before, some of the causes here are going to be prolactinoma, a thyroid issue, or a primary ovarian insufficiency versus a hypothalamic dysfunction. Along with these, make sure to keep in mind PCOS, which is a major cause of irregular bleeding, so make sure to keep this on your differential as well. So we already talked about how we would work up these top four issues listed here, but what about PCOS? So PCOS can be diagnosed a variety of different ways, but the preferred method is through the Rotterdam criteria, which we will list uh, below in the description box so that you have that information. But the thing to really look out for on test questions is going to be any signs of hyperandrogenism as well as irregular menstrual cycles. All right, so now that we've gone over causes of abnormal uterine bleeding as well as how to categorize them and evaluate them further, let's go over a practice question to solidify our understanding. Here we have a 38-year-old woman, G1P1, comes to the office because she has been unable to conceive for the past year. She and her husband have had unprotected sexual intercourse three times weekly during this time. They have a six-year-old daughter. During the past year, menses have occurred at a regular 90 to 120 day intervals. Her last period was two months ago. Menses previously occurred at regular 30 day intervals. She used an oral contraceptive for four years after the birth of her daughter, but discontinued it 14 months ago. She has had no history of serious illness and takes no medications. The patient appears well. She is 163 centimeters or 5 feet and 4 inches tall and weighs 63 kilograms or 140 pounds. BMI is 24. Vital signs are within normal limits and examination shows no abnormalities. Before we go over the serum studies, let's go over some of the key things in the history here. So the concern here is infertility as the patient has not been able to conceive for the past year despite having had unprotected sexual intercourse with her partner. We're told that she's now developed irregular menstrual cycles where normally she used to have regular 30-day intervals. So this patient is experiencing abnormal uterine bleeding, in particular irregular bleeding, but we have to figure out what is the cause of this irregular bleeding. So we're told that this patient's thyroid hormone is 3, which is normal. Her FSH is 100, which is actually very elevated, especially for somebody who is not postmenopausal, where we would expect the FSH level to be high. Her prolactin level is 10, which is normal, and then her beta HCG is negative, so that's a negative pregnancy test. So given the fact that the FSH here is elevated, especially for a woman at her age, we're concerned that there's something going on with the ovaries here or a premature ovarian insufficiency. Normally, it would help to also have an estrogen level, but because the FSH here is elevated, this also makes it less likely to be a hypothalamic cause because in that case, we would have expected a low FSH level. Well, now we have our diagnosis, but this is a two-part question. So we're being asked, what does this diagnosis put her at risk of? So this patient has premature ovarian insufficiency and so is going to experience low estrogen levels. Normally, this occurs when women go through menopause, but she's experiencing this prematurely. And we know that estrogen is key for bone strength, so this patient is at risk of osteoporosis. So that was the correct answer here. Please make sure to like and subscribe so we can keep doing what we're doing. And as always, good luck studying everyone.